All right, we had to get Derek Piper on the podcast. We had to do it quickly because we're, we're at uh, go time, Derek. Uh, we're on the clock right now. Uh, how is Haley doing? And uh, are, are we within a couple of days of, of baby Piper showing up? Where are we at? That's what the prognosticators are saying. That's what the crystal ball pick, picks are in for the, from the doctors yesterday. said pretty likely within the next 24 to 48 hours that she oh. – begins labor. So uh, the due date's Monday, so we're in that window anyway. But uh, we're on commit watch, baby watch, whatever you want to call it. It's coming. I thought it was always uncomfortable when people called you this on the board, but now, like, soon we can actually call you Pipe Daddy. Like, that is... <laughs> <laughs> that made me uncomfortable before, but but it's it's soon to be here. And you're gonna kill it, Derek. You and Haley will absolutely kill it. Um, I, I always tell people this. I know I've told you this before, but every emotion you can have times 10. Like that, that is that is parenthood. And uh it's it's a roller coaster, but it is it is well worth the ride, man. I appreciate those words. And uh I'm nervous, I'm excited, I'm I'm feeling some of that that whole mix right now, but I know it'll be amplified once I uh, ultimately have them in my hands here uh, pretty wow. soon. So uh, I don't go through the tough part. I, I'm worried about seeing the wife in pain and whatnot, but it's part of the process and, and she's, she's tough. She'll get through it. And, and then we'll, we'll experience this together. Yeah. It feels like going through this, like where you're just kind of the supporting cast here, like you're going to make a mistake, but you got to learn from it. So you're a freshman now, right? Like first right. time, first time we went through this, like we were in the hospital. I was like, my wife had started labor, but it was early. And I'm like, can I take a shower? So I went and take a shower. She wouldn't let me live it down forever. And, and then I went and got like some Jimmy John's just so I would have some food through it. She couldn't eat. And she was really upset about that. So um, be careful with some of those things because she won't let you live it down for the rest of your life. Dear. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll be thinking about every choice and making sure that it doesn't get thrown back in my face, but uh, I got a bag packed. I got some snacks. Hopefully they, they push me through there and uh, I'll just do whatever she says. Yes. That, that is the best thing to do. And, and keep ice handy, ice in a, in a little rag. So you can like pat her down a little bit. That, that's the most important yeah, yeah. thing. It's amazing, man. They are, they are unbelievable. Women are unbelievable. Uh, what they're able to do here. Anyway, this people didn't tune in for the birth podcast, but uh, I, I bet they enjoy that. All the dads out there. Let's talk some Illini basketball, Derek. And April is absolutely crazy uh, with the incoming guys, the outgoing guys. We'll talk about some transfer possibilities, uh, some new possibilities for Illinois, some of the names we talked about before. But let's start in-house. And the big news, I think, is that Sky Clark is officially an Illini. And the five-star prospect, wherever he ends up, whether it's 35, 25, one of the highest-ranked prospects Illinois has had in a long time. Now he comes with an injury he's been dealing with for the last year with the knee, still trying to get up to 100% there. But certainly, Derek, a, a really talented piece. And the future of the backcourt with he, Jade Nepp, Sincere Harris. And then you add Ty Rogers to this class. He can handle a little bit. I think he's doing that on display at the Jordan practice today, the Jordan Brand uh, classic practice today. So, man, the future looks bright. Like, one of these guys, two of these guys could be gone within two years. We know that. But you keep stacking this kind of talent, and this is just raising it to another level. Yeah, we've seen this staff and even the changing of the staff. Brad Underwood would be able to covet a lot of top 100 talents. And Io in that top 50 range, same with Kofi, even Adam Miller and Andre Curbelo as well. But Sky Clark's even up another level when he gets to be in that five-star guard. And uh, we know that pre-injury, if you watch his tape out there, he is very, very talented. And uh, now is just the process of getting him back to that pre-injury form and being able to have the same type of burst an explosion, but this is one hell, one heck of a group in terms of talent and guys that can provide some instant impact. And while we're still waiting to see how the, all the dominoes fall and will there be a veteran ball handler, we can talk all about that. But uh, this is setting you, you up to have a lot of talent and big picture wise, you can be really excited. And even if you get Kofi back, you can have a pretty darn good team next year too. So uh, it's a big deal. And, and to have Clark on the dotted line and about two months out from when all four of those guys will show up on campus and get summer workouts rolling. Uh, it's an exciting time and, and certainly lots of like about how they complement each other. And like you said there with Ty Rogers, I didn't think Sincere Harris has some ability off the bounce too. And that just probably makes your offense a little bit more dynamic, just having some versatile pieces that can do some different things. I, I want to pause for a second and zoom out, Derek. Like we, we talked about this a little bit, but the level Brad Underwood is recruiting at, I mean, four of the last five classes are 
our top five Big Ten classes, top 20, top 25 classes. Um, you know, 14 four or five star prospects in the last five years under Brad Underwood is, is second only to Michigan. And Michigan is recruiting at another level than everybody in the Big Ten, basically. How has he been able to do this? Because I thought he'd be kind of the, the John B line, get some underrated guys, develop them, and then they take off. Well, he got Kofi and, and Io and, and even guys like Alan Griffin was kind of what I was expecting him to do. But he's gotten these top prospects, Corbello, Miller, year after year uh, to where, hey, it's not a surprise. You, you land a bunch of top talent. You're going to be competing at the top of the Big Ten. So how has he done it? It's been really impressive, and it has been about assembling the right staff and knowing that you're going to have connections beyond just inside the state. And when you look at this run here, of course, you had Io, you had Adam coming from inside the state, even if you threw DeMonte in that mix. But a lot of other guys have been without, you know, outside your region. Uh, you have Kofi, you have the inter international route. You get someone like Sky, uh, who's from down in, in Tennessee, now playing in, in Florida. So uh, being able to pick from different areas of talent where, in the past, of Illinois basketball, I know that they did that, of course, when you get a Darren Williams or uh, there have been some examples of that in the past, like the 80s, you lean pretty heavily on the state having a bunch of talent. And that certainly played out well for the program. And even you think about the Peoria pipeline, you think about a downstate guy like Brian Cook, but for them to for Brad to be able to get assistants that have other ties and they sold uh, opportunity, they sold vision, they sold style of play early on and they started to win. And now they've really been able to couple everything with the connections, with the winning Big Ten championships, Io in the NBA. So there's just the momentum has continued to progress forward. And I think we were looking to see if they could take one more step with coupling the success with then further promise in the future with this recruiting. And, and they've been able to do that in this class. And there is excitement already. Mares Johnson, the type of prospect he is in 2024. And now you have the portal, too, to be able to pursue talent. So. Uh, they've just made this sell even better as they've gone forward. It's credit to Brad for bringing in the right guys. And, and we can't, I know it's easy to look at certain assistants with the ties, but Brad is ultimately a guy in that room too. that has got to be able to close and got to be able to connect with these recruits. And he's been able to do a very good job in that too. Yeah. And Sky just so happens to have a brother who's pretty talented too. ZZ in the class of 2024. He's visiting this weekend or next week along with uh, Sky for his official. So uh, if you could start that class with Merez Johnson and ZZ Clark, pretty good, pretty good start there as well. Uh, before we get to the rest of the roster, Derek, um, Sky, we'll see how he bounces back from this injury. That is an X factor in all of this, but Illinois seems very confident that, that he's going to be good uh, once the, the fall comes around. So these guys are going to play. Right. And, and no matter what people thought of, should pods play more? Should Melendez and Goody play more? I think Melendez obviously was earning that role until the appendectomy, right? Brad has played freshman a lot. I, I mean, Miller started every game. Curbelo was the Big Ten sixth man of the year. Kofi played, started. Oh, Io played, started, right? Like he's not afraid to play really talented freshmen. So these guys are going to be a huge part of next year's team. So, what is your expectation for each one of these four guys? I think you look at Sky Clark being someone that as he gets back to being fully healthy, a guy that slots in is probably a day one starter. He's going to have that opportunity. And that's not to say that Jaden Epps can't be in competition with him. I think it'll be interesting, again, if they do add a veteran ball handler, maybe they add a veteran bigger guard, uh, maybe Clark's the one, and you, you put someone like a, a Terrence Shannon. We can talk about some of the other names uh, on that list of guys that are off guards that can do some different things. Or maybe if it's a Courtney Ramey, who might be a potentially a primary ball handler, just a capable ball handler. Maybe Scott could play the two, but he's going to be a guy that's one of your primary scorers in that backcourt. Um, certainly a score first guard that can get his own. And I know that's something that Brad really likes about both him and Jaden Epps. I think that when you're looking at Epps, it will be determined about who else comes in, but potentially, I mean, there's a situation based on how some of the dominoes fall, or if you don't get some of the guys you're in on, maybe Epps and Clark are your starting one and two that that, is within the realm of possibility. Otherwise, I, I could see Epps coming off the bench as a, a microwave bucket getter that's leading that second unit with the ball in his hands. Uh, Sincere Harris is a lengthy two-way guard that uh, comes off the bench, I think, and, and can play defense, can slash to the rim. Uh, I see him ultimately as being a plus shooter as he continues to develop. Maybe we've seen some guys who are good shot makers don't shoot at the great, the greatest as a freshman. So maybe that's something with him we'll have to see, but uh, maybe not a ton of 
a point production, but not, I mean, he's a capable scorer that's also going to get after it defensively. We know that Brad, in terms of minutes allocations, if you can play defense, you're probably going to get in the game. So I would think that Harris will log some minutes off the bench. And we know Ty Rogers, very versatile, could play multiple positions, can definitely guard. Uh, his shot is going to probably determine ultimately how much he's going to be on the court because you don't want to have uh, a shooting liability, not that he can't develop that. And around Kofi, I think that's something that if you get him back, maybe you try to put situations together. I really like the idea of Rodgers playing the four and Hawkins at the five. Like that wow. seems like – or even Danger, because Danger can stretch the floor too. So uh, I think he'll be in that mix. But I could see Clark being a double-digit scorer, a starter, Epps off the bench potentially, maybe even pushing for a starting role that's going to score eight to ten. And then Harris and, and Rodgers off the bench as well and kind of bench roles, supplementary or su- supplement. That's a tough word. <laughs> supplementary roles. Um, I think everybody's going to play out of that group. Yeah. Um, of course, we'll, we'll be sitting there in December and January and someone will be getting the amount of tech that the fan base likes and we'll be on one of these podcasts talking about it. Yeah. Concerned. And uh, in the transfer portal, they'll be concerned. And and that's just part of what it is today, but you got to play players who help you win. And towards the end of the year, Brad Underwood certainly was playing Coleman Hawkins and RJ Melendez a lot. And uh, I did walk by both, the, both those guys um, and today. I was on my way to football practice, Derek. So they seem like they're going to be a part of the future. And, and that's so huge because you plug those guys into the starting lineup. If Kofi's back or if it's danger with Sky Clark and whoever you get in the transfer portal, you certainly feel like you have a young talented promising team and, and and Kofi obviously will determine what we think of the the team next year and it's for Derek but it is going to be an intriguing young kind of fun team to watch I, I know like hey like there's a, a wider spectrum of what can happen and it might not it might be ugly early on next year but I do think it's fair for fans to be excited about something new especially when you have so many talented pieces like that yeah here recently especially last year, and you can even rope in the previous year, you had a lot of proven commodities, guys that you knew what you were going to get. And that's not to say we don't have a pretty good idea of these skill sets and what certain guys can bring, but I think it'll be a fun thing for the fans to watch it grow and watch yeah. young pieces develop and mature and and see the, the steps forward. Like it was fascinating to watch that 2019-20 team like finally hit their stride. And, and even the year before when they won – at home against Michigan State, and they stormed the floor, and the win at Madison Square Garden against Maryland. Now, the good thing is Underwood's put this roster in position, especially if Kofi comes back. You're still going to be in win-now mode, but you're going to have some younger pieces that are going to have to go through some bumps in the road, uh, and we're going to have to see that uh, certainly play out, but also be able to to bring talent to the floor and be able to produce. And uh, can we see a huge step forward from R.J. Melendez, like freshman to sophomore leap, uh, that we saw some some guys make some pretty huge ones around the Big Ten last year. Can he be that guy this year? Coleman Hawkins, we know he has a lot of ability. So uh, that all piecing together, I know that we ha- maybe you haven't seen a year where you can go, here's all these guys that can come back next year, not to even overlook you know this upcoming season, but down the road, like this nucleus of talent could be really, really good for Illinois. And then, oh, by the way, if you have Kofi for one more year, why, why not? take a run at that and, and see it really just mature throughout the season and then hope to be playing your best basketball at the end. Yeah. Like I'm trying to think Derek, like of all the recruiting classes, you know, Io was so big by himself. Uh, I think Herbella Miller w- was similar to this one. You bring those two guys in and, and you're feeling like, Oh, here's the next wave. Um, you know, sometimes you felt that with Bruce, with Brandon Paul and DJ Richardson, obviously Myers and, and Jeremy, but that there's an excitement uh, when that starts to happen. But when that happens, you also get players, who get over recruited, right? And Brandon Pajemski is is one of those. I certainly think we saw some small flashes, right? And the Northwestern game, you saw something from Pods. The Missouri game in a blowout, you saw something from Pods. Uh, but but clearly his role was in flux even before they added Sky Clark. So they add Sky Clark. They're certainly looking for a transfer to to start to play a big role for them. So this made sense for Brandon Pajemski. I, I think Brandon Pajemski can be a good player at, at this level. Can he be a great one? I don't know. I, I haven't seen enough of him, but what do you make of, of Pajemski entering the transfer portal and, and, and where do you think he, uh, is the kind of school he could end up? Yeah, I think that he does deserve credit for making some strides and be able to carve out a role and be ready when called upon, albeit not very often throughout this past season. And uh, he came in through the summer and hadn't played very, very good competition and kind of got thrown into the fire of 
playing on a team that won a Big Ten title and going up against those guys and those veterans uh, and, and was someone that was willing to defend. We know that he's a talented shot maker, just has to do it uh, at this level, the speed of the game and everything. So uh, and he could have been in the mix to earn a role. It's just nothing was guaranteed in terms of having a big jump in playing time. That wasn't necessarily guaranteed for him. So for him to look for a different spot where there's a clear path to playing time, it's certainly understandable. I think I know it's already been reported by his AU coach that he's had interest from other power five conferences. And I think that uh, could he even end up in a, at a big 10 school like a Minnesota looking for some talent or a Northwestern? I don't know that Wisconsin's going to happen because of the, the way things got uh, played out with Tyler Hero. Of course, that's that's his guy, uh, Pods, and, and played for the same AAU program. But a Marquette, that could that could be a situation. I know they do have quite a bit of, of freshman guards coming in, though. But uh, it'll be interesting to see just really up to what kind of role he's looking for. If he really wants to be like have a chance to start immediately, maybe it is at a mid-major level uh, where he would try to land. Otherwise, it's a power five team that doesn't have as much traffic in the backcourt where he can maybe try to earn that earn that role. So. Uh, he does have scoring talent. He's going to have to prove it at this level. But, yeah, he did show some flashes of, of being able, uh, able to make some plays and uh, does have some some skills that he likes. I mean, you don't get offered by Illinois, Kansas, Kentucky without something to like, even if it was in a situation. It was just a really interesting time to recruit where guys couldn't get out and, and evaluate in person. And it was all over, over video and stream and, and highlights and everything like that. But um, it didn't work out ultimately at Illinois. But I understand why he would want to look for a little bit more opportunity. Yeah. I think this is one of those where I, I, I don't think there's hard feelings. It's just, Hey, like, you know, Pajimski, we're recruiting different guys um, and you can have a role, but you got to earn it. And Pajimski's like, Hey, I can go find a better spot for me. So I, it makes sense. I don't think there's a lot of hard feelings here. Um, Kofi Coburn, we're going to know in 10 days, Derek. So this isn't going to drag into July. This is not going to drag into August. Kofi Coburn will have to let us know. And, I was asked on Sirius XM this morning, like, what's my gut on this? And I go, listen, I, Kofi might just want to go, right? But I feel like the longer this drags on, the more he's considering returning. And if you made a, a list of pros and cons of going pro now and maybe getting a two-way contract, maybe, or coming back to Illinois, making half a million to a million dollars, which I think is, is, is realistic, uh, setting the all-time record for points and rebounds and making money and just being in college and being one of the faces of college for one more year before you ultimately take that plunge. Um, I just think it makes the most sense for him right now to, to come back, given what his uh, NBA future is, what his NBA stock is, at least the way we know it. I think it all, makes all the sense in the world or more sense for him to come back to Illinois. What do you think in 10 days out? I'm just glad it's only 10 days and we're going to have an answer unless you subscribe to, Hey, did you hear you might hit the portal? No, I haven't really heard that. And if I did, I wouldn't believe it for a second. Please don't do that to us, Kofi. Uh, for those that cover you, um, I wouldn't blame him either way. If he looks at himself as a guy that's going to turn 22, I think this off season and be a two-time all American and understand that his draft stock might ultimately just be what it is. And he earned a decent amount through NIL as far as we know this past year, Maybe he just wants to try his chance and, and seek out that two-way deal and, and try to make it and try to live the professional basketball lifestyle. I think in terms of the money and the guarantee and that, that money what, that he would earn this upcoming year, it makes the most sense to go back to Illinois. And, and depending on who you talk to, and I was even hearing, you know, when I was in Indy and hearing some talk, like they think Illinois thinks they can substantially out shoot the two-way guarantee which would be if you sign the two-way and you have it throughout the year it'd be just south of, of 500k I think they can get to a point of, of being a step above that maybe a little bit farther I don't know can you push a million I think that some people think you can think about this conversation three years ago like think about us right. three years ago <laughs> listening to ourselves now talk about this it's great it's great for Kofi it's great for college basketball I mean Think about North Carolina. They can bring Baycott, Caleb Love, basically bring everybody back. How great is that for the sport? Like, and how great is it for the kids? How great is it for the universities, the athletic programs? It's great. I think it's, I think it's fantastic. Um, I know like all of these rules are dealing with it. There's consequences of the tr transfer portal, the unknown, the uncertainty we have now. Some fans, I get it. You want to see your team grow. Um, but there's also positives of it. And this is one of them being able to go to the transfer portal and, 
you know, add somebody who can help you right away rather than some random high school or European kid who's probably not going to pan out. Like it's just fantastic for a guy like Kofi that, that he's able to have that option now. Like maybe he doesn't pick it. Maybe he just wants to go pro, but to have that option, I think it's a great thing for those guys. Yeah, it definitely is. And I think that in terms of having guys leave when they're ready, it, it certainly helps guys stay in college a little bit longer, develop more. Uh, but also we, we know their value, a guy like Kofi with that star power, a guy like Drew Timmy at Gonzaga, who's going through a similar decision about how he fits in the NBA or projections, probably, you know, he might be a second round pick maybe, uh, but is a, one of the faces of college basketball to come and make a lot of money if you were to return in NIL. So those guys just benefiting off of their star power and their marketability that, you know, previous to this, it was not, uh, they weren't allowed to earn anything. And it was just on the programs to be able to, to covet that. So uh, you feel good for those guys and know that no matter what decision, they're going to be able to make money and, and be able to have a good, have a good lifestyle and, and a deserving one for, for what they bring to the table. Yeah. I'm, I'm going through like this Rolodex of college basketball players are like, ah, if just 10 years earlier or something. D Brown, Tyler hands wrote Jimmer for debt. Like, oh, yeah. you know, some of those guys who could have stayed for an extra year. I mean, Steph Curry, probably not at that point, but it's just like some of those guys could have just met JJ Redick. Like some of these Kemba. guys you hated Yeah, Kemba. Yep. Like I, those are some of the guys that have pop up in my head. All right, Derek, let's talk about some of the potential transfer possibilities coming in first a big one came off the board brandon murray to georgetown yeah he's going to the school that just lost 21 straight games and a coach that should definitely be on the hot seat and patrick Ewing. i i can't believe how much of a, a dumpster fire it's been under him but kevin nickelberry the former lsu assistant goes there brandon murray follows him not too big of a surprise i, I mean that kind of seemed lined up but what's that mean for illinois because i got the feeling Derek, like brandon murray was their number one target I think he was. I think even when you consider Terrence Shannon as a guy that is on NBA radars, at least, and thought to be someone that could be a draft pick if he comes back and, and continues to develop, that Brandon Murray, while he didn't shoot the three as well as Terrence this past year and maybe isn't even as polished as him quite yet, just what he did as a freshman and who he can develop into uh, was a guy that they highlighted as their their top guy in the portal and was thought to be a very, very good two-way player with size that could progress as a three-point shooter. thought that, they, that he could, as he goes along, be a, a knockdown shooter from three, do some things off the dribble and really defend. And uh, they were in the final three, and they spent two of their days in the evaluation period this past weekend back on campus hosting him for an official. He goes to Tennessee, he goes to Illinois, he goes to Georgetown. And, yeah, Georgetown, because of Nickelberry, was pointed to right when he hit the portal of, okay, that's a likely destination. Now, he had to make a decision – in terms of what that situation around him was going to look like. And I mean, he's going to have a point as we look at it right now, he's going to have plenty of shots. He might be the number one player on Georgetown. I don't know how many games they're going to win. Uh, he is closer to home being a Baltimore native about an hour away from DC. So, uh, and playing for a coach that he's very familiar with, but Illinois was trying to sell winning opportunity. They certainly have. And then NIL potential too, for a program that's more relevant and for, uh, alumni base and fan base it's very bought in on supporting their team their players and making sure that nil is a very good avenue for for guys to make money i would say that the next two guys that we think about terrence shannon um courtney ramey two guys who are kind of what composite i would say consensus top 10 uh transfer prospects out there uh, i think ramey would fit this team incredibly well like, like terrence shannon is certainly a talent long athletic and shoot the three uh, from Chicago makes a lot of sense. Uh, but you, you pair Courtney Ramey with that young backcourt. I, I just think it makes all the sense in the world. Uh, but but any feeling on those, Derek? I love the Ramey fit, too, as long as he understands and is on the same page in terms of role. I think that, you know, last year getting pulled off the ball, I he didn't play with the ball in his hands a decent amount, just a lot less than he had prior to that when they brought in Marcus Carr and they brought in Devin Askew. Of course, with the change with Chris Beard, but – a great primary defender, a guy you can look at, who's the best option in whatever opponent's backcourt, throw Ramey on there. I mean, he defended the heck out of Oshai Abaji in a matchup at Kansas late in the year where Abaji goes one for 11 from the field, and Ramey got a lot of credit for that and can defend on the ball and, and can also be a facilitator. Because I look at 
Clark and Epps as score first guys. And I don't think that Ramey has to be your primary option offensively in terms of getting his own shot. I think he can get guys involved. I think that you can play him with an Epps, play him with a Clark. I think that I like the dynamic and the possibility of your back starting backcourt being Ramey, Clark, and Melendez, and, and then go on to the line, Hawkins and Kofi. That'd be a pretty darn good group. And uh, even if it is Clark making a play off the bounce, which he's very good at, Ramey was a top level catch and shoot guy. You look at some of his numbers and he was in the 90th plus percentile last two years in catch and shoot three. So uh, I think he makes a ton of sense as long as, and I don't, I'm not really worried about minutes either. I think he'd play a bunch of minutes in that backcourt. I love that he's a, a gritty competitor. I think he could be a leader in that backcourt that would be important. Shannon, you love the explosiveness. He might be the most explosive player in the portal and someone that can has improved a lot as a three-point shooter. We know he's a slasher. We know he can defend. I think transition game, and Brad talked to yesterday about wanting to play faster and really being run and gun next year. Uh, I think that Shannon helps you do that. But Ramey, to me, makes a lot of sense. I, although I'm curious in your thoughts, I was a little – not that Brad has always showed his hand to us, but yeah. I asked him, is a veteran ball handler a need? And he – wasn't really that committal. Who's kind of non-committal on that? Yeah, I think he wants his young guys to, to, to have it. But I mean, showing interest in Ramey, some of the guys, like it feels like they'd love to hand the ball to the Sky and to Jaden Epps. And, and I think that'd be fine. And I think they're they're cool with dealing with some of the pressure. But there's not a lot of pressure on these guys to to be a four or three seed next year. It's just make the tournament, have have an extended run. Everybody's happy. Um, but Courtney Ramey's different because Courtney Ramey can play the two right? Like he, and he's such a good defender. He's a veteran, as you said, and he can play off of Epps. He can play off of Clark. Uh, so I, I just think he makes a lot of sense, but they certainly have shown a lot of interest in two guards, Derek. It feels like that's the number one position they're kind of focused on. And the moment this guy hit the portal, I texted you Naheem Aline from Virginia tech. Of course, anybody that the staff has connections to makes sense, but he hits threes at about a 38% clip. He defends fairly well, uh, and it seems like he defended even better the year before. But yeah, Chester Frazier knows him. Chester Frazier uh, coached him at, at Virginia Tech. Not a star, but let's be honest. If you don't get Ramey or Shannon, this team just needs veteran guards. They, they just need somebody you can count on. And Naheem Aline, kind of a 3 and D guy, but it, he's a guy that I think you'd feel comfortable sliding in as, as a starter and, and really helping the, this young backcourt and kind of supplement all your other pieces. Yeah, three years of high major experience, two years as a starter this past year, put up 10 a game, shot the three about 37, 38%. He's six foot four lefty uh, that, yeah, could, could fit in that backcourt as a shooter, could also be a defensive piece that can mix in there. And Chester Frazier is very familiar with him. I was even going back and reading an article um, written by is it Chris Ash for our Virginia Tech site, uh, who said that uh, he listed. Uh, Aline, I, I was going to say his, his last name, Aline is one of the guys that Chester recruited uh, as a primary recruiter. So not only that, as he coached him, he was the guy that brought him into Virginia Tech. So uh, that certainly makes a lot of sense. And sometimes uh, when these guys enter the portal, they kind of have an idea, right? Like, and, and yeah. I would imagine Chester would be one of the first ones to reach out. Andrew Slater reported Illinois did reach out. And I would imagine Illinois is going to be a player there. I, I mean, this is speculation, but it all just kind of lines up, right? Yeah, it definitely makes a lot of sense. And for them already to be in the mix and they were listed towards the top. Slater, I, I think when he puts out those long lists of interests, he kind of understands who he's putting towards the top there as contenders. Now he's from Georgia, so I know that Georgia and Georgia Tech were on there. Uh, Illinois was was then listed uh, towards the top as well. But it makes a lot of sense in terms of need, uh, veteran, and then the connection to Chester. Um, that would be a pretty decent ad, I would think. Another guy I think is realistic, maybe not your top option, but – I want to mention him because we, we got our sights set on like the best possible guys, but uh, Gerard Lucas out of Oregon state, this is a guy who averaged 12, 13 points a game in the pack 12. Now he didn't do much else. And, and I texted you, I go, I think this is taller Alfonso Plummer, but that can still be a really good piece because again, you need some proven players and, and he's six foot three. Um, he, he's a big body a big part of what they did making the elite eight, then they go three and 28. It's one of the crazier turnarounds, the negative way I've seen, but still a guy that, that can make sense and would be gettable. Uh, but one more guy I want to bring up, Derek is Ben Vanderplas. Uh, man, I didn't know his name would come back up after dropping 20 and almost beating Illinois along with Jason Preston uh, with 
when we were part of like a hundred people who were actually there to see it, uh, the third game, third game of that season in 20, yeah. 2021, very good stretch for really skilled, pretty good defensively as well, at least at his level. But what do you make of the interest in Ben Vanderplas? He's a good player. That was a good Ohio team that I liked watching a lot. And they pulled the upset in the first round over Virginia. Uh, it's interesting because Virginia is one of the schools along with Wisconsin that's thought to be big players there because he's from Wisconsin. His dad played with Tony Bennett at Green Bay uh, way back in the, the early 90s. So uh, some connections there. But in terms of Illinois' interest, he makes sense as a shooter, a skilled forward that uh, offensively can bring a lot of different things to the table. I think you can shoot a three, shoot the mid-range, you can post guys up. He's a good passer, too. I think that uh, as someone, especially in the world where Kofi doesn't come back, maybe as a, a front court piece that can pull out to the perimeter and guards can cut and come off screens, and he can make decisions. He, he could fit into that mix. I think defensively, making the jump up to the, the Big Ten level, especially if he's going to play anywhere outside the four, I think he's a natural fit at the four, six foot eight, 230, 235. But can he play the five? I don't. I don't think so in terms of guarding most fives. Can he play the three? I don't know if he moves quite as well for some athletic wings that we see, but he would be a, a very intriguing piece. He's very talented offensively. There's a lot to like there. Um, and someone that if he would were to buy into being in the mix with a Coleman Hawkins, Ty Rogers type deal at that forward, those forward spots, um, I'd certainly like that. I think he makes a lot of sense if Kofi doesn't come back. Like I, I think he'd be interested too. Uh, if Kofi comes back, it might be harder to sell him. Plus, can, can he play the three? I'm not quite sure. Um, and then how, how do you separate those minutes? But it kind of brings me to this there. I, I, he's a Wisconsin native. Wisconsin certainly would make a lot of sense for him as well. Virginia, as you said, makes a lot of sense. But it's kind of Illinois in these next 10 days kind of setting themselves up to kind of go parallel tracks, right? Like if you can search for these big men and they've, they've reached out to Manny Bates, some other big men, I think Morris Odesi was another one. Uh, you can look at the stretch fours or threes that can make a lot of sense. If you don't have Kofi guys who can make shots once the defense collapses, uh, that's kind of what they seem to be doing over this lot next week is all right. If Kofi comes back, we go on this route. If, if Kofi doesn't come back, we go on this route. Cause it does seem like they'd want, maybe another front course piece, whether that's a three or a four. Yes. And I know that, I mean, if Kofi doesn't come back, we might be having more conversations about a Vanderplas or even a Bryce Hopkins or a Dawson Garcia that's in the transfer portal once again. And Illinois thought they were getting them until kind of a change in the 11th hour last summer. And he goes to North Carolina. I know that Minnesota being that's his home state and have a pull there to try to get him in the big 10, but just for a different school. But I think that you could sell a four who could play a significant role if Kofi's not there because Hawkins can slide and play a decent amount of five. Not, I don't know if he'd be your starting five. Maybe it'd be danger. And then Hawkins playing the four, but those would be your two primary fives. Probably not that I think Benjamin Bossman's Verdonk would still be in the mix. Uh, so without Kofi, there would be kind of that consideration of, do we add a backup five or do we add maybe an impact four that can then play a decent amount at that spot? And then we'll play Hawkins a decent amount at the five. So, um, and yeah, I mean, why wouldn't you prepare either way? And the fact that you don't have to, I mean, last year there were some five men that they wanted to go after. They showed preliminary interest in, but it was like, we're not going to have an answer until July, you know, June, July. So it was hard for Illinois really to, to cover. I mean, they got Omar Payne, but uh, mm -hmm. there were some other guys that maybe were more of a sure thing in terms of the starting five man that they couldn't really press for. So now that the answer is going to be relatively soon, they can position themselves to not keep guys on the hook for too long and, and just make sure that they're good either way. And Derek, I, I want to mention this. We've seen some really good players, even in their portal the last couple of days. We still got 15 more days. Um, we're, we're got 15, 16 more days where guys can – can enter the portal. So how do you expect Illinois just to uh, approach this over the next couple of weeks? And Brad really seemed to suggest yesterday to you guys, he doesn't know if this May 1st deadline is going to mean anything. So I don't know what you made of all of that. Yeah. I was wondering about that too, because we've seen here in recent years, guys that declare for the draft decide to come back and then enter the portal. And previously that has been allowed to be able to then move and, and still be eligible. We saw Kofi entering the portal and he was going to play next year, regardless. I don't think he was going to transfer uh, 
ultimately. But uh, yeah, I think that that's interesting because then you just extend it out of, of when more guys can pop up at certain times. Cause there has usually been post draft process guys coming back. And then there are maybe three, four, sometimes five legitimate marquee, marquee names who are at least good enough to get a look at the draft combine that are looking for somewhere else to go. So uh, that'll be interesting if that plays out to where that May 1st date is irrelevant. Um, but there's still going to be a decent amount of movement. I mean, the, the portal's growing by the day. There are some names continually whispered that might that might open things up and, and hit the portal. So uh, it's going to be an interesting couple more weeks as we go along and potentially even longer than that. But uh, I think as you look at it now, you've got Plummer opening up a spot, Curbelo, Pods, Payne. Those are four out. And then, of course, your four freshmen coming in. We still got to hear on Kofi. Got to hear on Grandison. We got to hear on Hutcherson. Uh, those are three. And then if there were someone like Brandon Lieb to hit the portal. So there's some, still some potential for spots to come open. And as we talked about, a guard makes a lot of sense, whether it potentially be two backcourt pieces, a handler, and then maybe a, a two-way big guard. And then uh, based on Kofi's decision, maybe another front court piece as well. Well, Derek, it's going to be an interesting few weeks, but the biggest addition is going to be Baby Piper. Uh, <laughs> how, how quickly does is a basketball in Baby Piper's hands? I'm going to try to do it almost immediately. Uh, we'll, we'll see if I can get away with that, but uh, we'll see how, how big the hands are. We'll, we'll measure. We'll get some combine measurements and uh, we'll see how that goes, but I'll, I'll be pushing that uh, pretty quickly. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Derek, Hey, uh, good luck to you and Haley. Uh, we'll cover it as, as well as we can and take anything that uh, you can give us, but uh, enjoy it, man. Enjoy the process. Uh, it is an amazing, amazing process and uh, fatherhood. There's nothing like it, man. So enjoy it. I appreciate that. I appreciate that a lot. I appreciate you and Joey holding it down when I'm gone. And shout out to our guy Wagner for his persistence. Persistence uh, yeah, up we, there, Jordan Brand Classic. Can we bring this up? Okay. We, we should get Joey on the pod just for this. But Joey Wagner was denied access to the Jordan Brand Classic. It really wasn't fair because a lot of guys in the line I beat and good for them. They, they got in. Uh, Joey didn't take no for an answer. He called the guy like three or four times, or emailed three or four times, then called, got denied every time. He found a way to get in that room today. Uh, and uh, I, I don't want to give all the backstory, but Joey Wagner got in that room, talked to Sky Clark, talked to ZZ Clark, talked to Kenny Clark, uh, the father, and then uh, caught up with Ty Rogers as well. So good for our man. Like our persistence, guy. man. <laughs> good for you all right, Derek Piper. Good luck, man. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon.